Hello everyone and welcome back to day 42 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So today I plan to finish off the uh, assembly tutorial or whatever you want to call it, assembly overview, assembly walkthrough, which uh, has now reached three parts and is going to end today. Although in the future as appropriate, we may dip in and talk more about this stuff, uh, obviously, but um, this is uh, going to, to finish off what I have planned for this time around. So um, before we dive in, and I'll probably be using this today to illustrate things, um, I think I mentioned all the way back, like if you've only watched these three episodes on assembly, then you wouldn't have seen them. But all the way back in the beginning uh, of the series, I mentioned that one of the best ways to sort of bootstrap yourself to a decent level of assembly knowledge is to look at the uh, compiler output. So start with a C compiler. Um, generate assembly output directly with, you know, dash capital S on GCC or Clang or whatever your compiler uses, or to disassemble a binary uh, back into hopefully readable assembly, ideally uh, intermixed with the original source code so you can kind of see the correspondence. And then from that, just by looking at it and kind of writing different snippets and seeing what the compiler does with it, kind of building up a base of understanding of, of how different constructs are translated. Um, and that used to be a little bit more awkward. Like the way I've always done that historically is actually using the debugger rather than um, the disassembly output. But um, nowadays, of course, you can use Godbo uh, Godbolt and um, probably the easiest way to do it. You don't have to muck around with, with any toolchain stuff. And, uh, and so just wanted to shout that out. And maybe I'll be using it today to show some examples. Uh, I just realized it also has a RISC-V um, target you can select so you can actually look at exactly what we're doing here. Uh, and one thing you'll note, even with their built-in squaring example, is that um, it's targeting RV32i, which is actually what uh, our emulator currently supports. But in particular, that means it doesn't have a built-in multiply instruction. Um, and so even something as simple as squaring a number requires a, um, a built-in routine. Um, and uh, you have to do mArch uh, RV. Well, you could do RV32m, I guess, or G. I guess it doesn't, or is it IM? Let's see if it okay yeah so I am would be the base ISA plus multiply integer multiply divide uh, and if you do G you get the, the the general purpose set of extensions which covers the base instructions M F D uh, which is a single and double precision floating point and I believe a which is for atomic memory instructions uh, op operations and stuff like that so anyway um, Use this tool to further um, sort of train your understanding of, of, I guess, the mapping between high-level and low-level constructs. Um, and uh, I would recommend trying to stick to simple snippets rather than big programs, because once you have bigger programs, the compiler is more likely to start uh, moving code uh, from its natural location relative to the source code, which, when you're optimizing things, is what you should do, but it makes it harder, generally, to correlate um, you know, the two sides of the translation. So anyway, um, enough of that. We'll probably refer to that later today, but um, let's go back into our assembly walkthrough. So uh, last time, what did we finish off with? Yeah, we, we finished off with um, short-circuiting logical expressions and how to translate them to uh, control flow. And so hopefully that was uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the major, um, I think there's, um, Two things I want to cover today, and I'll cover um, I'll cover the f one that I'd forgotten about, uh, which kind of which kind of belongs in this section. I want to quickly, or as quickly as I can, cover that before we move to the next big piece, which is really what we're going to finish off with, which is uh, you know writing functions and how to deal with saving and restoring registers and managing the stack and calling conventions and all that stuff. Um, so that's a big topic that's going to be a main topic, but I do want to finish off things related to control flow by covering uh, switch statements. Um, how to um, um, how how to translate switch statements to assembly? Um, so switch statements are generally used um, if you want the compiler to uh, generate jump tables. Um, if we assume computed go tos are available as a C language extension, as they are in GCC Clang. We can actually um, express, we can actually translate switch uh, statements to um, 
computed go to uh, computed go to's and tables and explicit jump tables. Um, um, like we've been doing uh, with other constructs uh, above. So the idea is the following. Suppose I have a uh, an integer variable x, and I do a switch, um, and actually say this is maybe get char. So because we, we, we've done enough of these by now to, to know the deal. We have a bunch of these in our lexer where we have these big switch statements that um, switch on the initial character of a token to decide how to tokenize the remainder of that uh, piece. Uh, and so, um, you know, suppose you have, you know, something like this, uh, scan uh, white space, or I don't know, this is called handle space break, um, handle new line, Handle zero, handle default. Um, let's just put breaks on all these. Um, something like this, uh, or maybe, and maybe I'll, I'll maybe I'll do it like this, just to follow our convention of using these capital letters to denote different code sections. Um, and I mean, we don't have to do it. We don't have to do it like that. We can just do keep it more abstract. So suppose you have something like this. Of of course, um, in general, if you're using a jump table, you expect there to be more than you know three explicit entries in a fallback case. Uh, the compiler is totally within its rights to turn this kind of switch into um, um, into a cascaded if else if chain and indeed some compilers will choose to do so in practice um, but let's focus on the case where a uh, jump table um, is is uh, is going to be generated so um, the translation for this is basically using go to computed go to's um, which I, I will show you how I'll show you how computed go to's translate to assembly code because uh, while, you know, if you're coming from a sort of C background, you have never seen any uh, assembly code whatsoever, uh, computed go-tos might appear as an esoteric feature. They're actually completely trivial from a uh, low-level perspective. They're much more trivial than most other C features, in fact. Um, and so uh, one of the benefits of doing this two-part translation where we start from, you know, a conventional switch statement and then translate into a table with computed go-tos uh, is that the the second half of you know the, 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 that that uh, computed go to and jump table uh, snippet will have a one to one translation to assembly code basically, and so the way this is going to work is um, is as follows: uh, we're going to um, we're going to create labels for each of the cases. Um, so I'm just going to call them something mononic so you can kind of uh, match them up. Um, and uh, and each of the breaks, just like, you know, if you remember when we were doing our loops where we had these kind of labels called like A underscore break or uh, whatever, um, we will have a, I will call it switch break, which is going to be a label. Um, at the end that corresponds to the start of E, right? Um, and so all the breaks are going to be replaced by that uh, there. Um, um, and so th this is the first part. Um, I'm using this dot 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 just to sort of signify. Imagine there are more cases to make this jump table use case uh, kind of practical, I guess. Um, and then finally, you have switch break, um, which contains the code for E. Um, I mean, I guess maybe I'll write it like this. Actually, I, let me keep the indentation, otherwise, it's maybe not as easy to see. Uh, the correlation between these two. And um, 
So, so, th so this is uh, essentially the, the case part, but now how do we do the switch? Because essentially what we want to do is based on the value of X, we want to choose which of these cases to go to. And so the idea is we're going to build a table and the table is going to contain, um, well, let's see here. Um, it's going to be a table of pointers. So these are going to be uh, instruction pointer address, you know, instruction pointers, addresses of these labels um, that we can then go to, by, we do a table lookup, uh, which is based on a key derived from the um, uh, from, from the dispatch value, and then we do a go to through that. So um, let me show you how that goes. Um, I'm going to create two helpers, um, uh, two, two helper values here. Uh, and for, for now, let me just uh, leave them unspecified. But we're going to have uh, two helper values uh, corresponding to the minimum value that that is, you know, in this case, I guess it would be uh, the new line ASCII because that's value 10. And the maximum would be the zero. Um, but um, so this is going to be a table that stores. Uh, this is going to be the min and max value is going to be inclusive. So we subtract them and add one. Um, so if they're the same, for example, meaning they contain one entry, then the subtraction would yield zero plus one yields one, which is correct. Um, and then here we will store the biased um, the biased keys corresponding to the cases. So we want to store, um, for example, space, but we have to bias it by the min value. And so um, in this case here, this would be, I can't remember, what, well, it doesn't really matter what it is, um, but we, we bias it. Um, so that we can uh, we can index into the table easily, and um, and so this here is going to and this is where the computed go to stuff starts happening. So far, nothing we've written is really non-standard, but here we're going to use the computed go to extension, which lets us take the address of a label, uh, and you have to use a double ampersand for that. That's just the the syntax they chose. I think in theory they could have chosen to use the existing ampersand and just give it new meaning for labels because there's no existing meaning. I think that they would have to worry about colliding with. But anyway, um, so this is what you do. You take a um, you, you take the address corresponding to that uh, case, and you do that for the um, for the other cases also. Um, um, and then fill remaining entries with um, case default. Um, and this is something that's you know awkward to write and see if we're writing it by hand. But here I'm just writing it sort of like imagine filling all the all the entries in the range from min value or you know from zero up through the 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 length of the table. Imagine filling everything that's not been specified here with um, the address of this default case because those are going to correspond to what to do if you fall in this range and you're not one of these three enumerated cases. So. Um, then the dispatch logic that corresponds to the switch looks as follows. Um, we are going to, uh, and we're, we're, um, yeah, so, so X is still in scope. Um, we are going to do a range check against X. And we're say, uh, if X is in the range that is uh, represented in the table, um, then we are going to do a go to. And it's going to be a computed go to, which means that rather than jumping to a, a fixed label, we're going to jump to an address that has been computed in some way. And in this case, uh, and the notation for that is rather than doing go to followed by a, an identifier that names a label, you can actually any pointer type expression or void star or something like that can be used, uh, I suppose. And so, no, you have to dereference it, I guess. So I think go to asterisk is really the syntax for computed go to. This then has to be followed by you know, some operand of pointer type. Um, and so in our case, what we're going to do is we're going to look, uh, this probably should be called switch table. Um, we will call it switch table. And we're going to index it not by X itself because um, we only store values that are in this range. So we have to bias this by, um, by the min value. Um, I think that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, and 
if this doesn't if this case doesn't hit which means we're out of the range that is explicitly represented in the table then we just have a fall through case where we go to case default um and i think that's it that's really all you need for this um and if you um if you i mean i don't know i don't know if we can trick uh if we can trick the compiler into doing something useful here. Uh, it's sometimes hard when you're working with optimized code, but let's see if we can. Um, Okay, th this is doing uh, too good a job. It looks like it completely generates... No, that's not true. So this generates an if-else-if chain. Um, let's try... Let's try just adding more cases until it... Um, until whatever uh, thing flips in the compiler to generate a switch table, if it ever happens. Which may not happen. I, I, I may move to another compiler. It looks like it will always... Well, let, let's try a few more here. I know MSVC is much more eager to generate jump tables, um, but it would be nice if we could do it with the risk five target. Um, yeah, it looks like it's 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 not generating jump tables ever. Um, let, let's try another target. Uh, okay, this is the right thing. So um, here, um, so in case you don't know, I mean, all these things should look kind of alike, but basically this is an indirect jump uh, based on the value in the RCX register. You can see RCX has an offset added from RDX and RDX in turn is some sort of segment uh, base. So I think the thing that's stored in the jump table is not the absolute address, I guess because it's 64 bits. So maybe that would be too big. Uh, and so instead it stores, um, let's see. So it's adding RDX, RCX and Uh, so it loads a byte. This looks like a little bit of a fancier two-level scheme. Um, but uh, anyway, the point is uh, it's doing a... Uh, so it's subtracting... So it's subtracting 10, which corresponds to... Um, to min value because min, uh, you know the the new line value is 10 so it's basically I guess because it, it doesn't want to do a compare and then a, a subtract so it can it can you know you can basically do this um, and uh, and then bias it like this so I think it's it's, it's doing essentially this transformation I'm going to undo this I think the other way we're adding it is more clear but um, this is a more uh, better translation so it's subtracting that and then um, it's it's checking whether uh, I, I guess so I guess 57 is um, uh, blah, blah, blah. I guess no oh because it's it's not greater than or equal to right um, Let's check the other boundary case. Um, but anyway, it's this. I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on with this two-level scheme. So it's loading a byte, and then it's using. So it takes a dispatch value. It does a sign extended. 
move into the 64-bit register. Um, it then, right, it loads the space address. And then using RDX and RAX, it does a one byte lookup in this table. Um, and then turns that into, okay, I see what they're doing. So this is just a compression scheme. Um, I don't want you to get caught up too much on that. I see what they're doing. So basically what they're doing is, you know, th this table here, it has ranges, uh, it, it has a key range that spans from, you know, 10 to 47. Um, and there's only three non-standard values that are filled in. And so all the other values would be four bytes uh, or even eight bytes on a 64-bit. On a um, no, I guess they're never doing, they're never storing full 64-bit pointers. They're only storing 32-bit uh, offsets, even in the second level table. But basically what they're doing is um, they're, they have a one byte per entry table. Uh, which stores the offset into a second table. And so the first table for all these default entries can store just a single byte. Uh, and that way, uh, th this table here that corresponds to this here can only contain, I guess, would contain four entries corresponding to space, new line, zero, and default. And the first level table then contains, you know, basically zero, one, two, three, depending on which of the entries um, it wants to point to. So that's a, a, a kind of a table compression method. Um, and so, yeah, actually, let me let me write that out in C code just so I can see what it is, show you guys what it what it actually does. Um, but this thing here is like, I guess, if you have, uh, it depends on the sparsity or density of this uh, this range in terms of which of the entries are occupied, uh, what you'd want to use. Um, but let me uh, undo this stuff here. But anyway, you can see that basic idea being being played out for the, for that uh, generated code. Um, uh, you can also um, Add an extra level of indirection to the table lookup to compress the table when it has a lot of default. Uh, when it has a uh, few distinct entries uh, relative to the total number of entry of keys, and so uh, the way we would do that is. And I'm just going to show how this portion of the code is different. Um, basically, you have uh, you have a table here, um, and it goes like this. Um, I mean, let's make the the default case. This is the easiest way to do it because if we make the default case be zero, then we can zero initialize the unfilled entries. Um, and then this here becomes a uh, a one byte index, and um, this becomes uh, one, two, three, um, and then this here becomes um, yeah. The switch table still has to be accessed in this way, but then you have to do a second level lookup. Uh, into this table here. Um, uh, uh. All right, so that's a uh, Okay, that's it for that. Let me just make sure those indices are correct. Space, new line, zero. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Um, assuming we're dealing with the first case uh, with, without the extra table indirection, um, the translation to assembly code is simple and direct. And so uh, let me basically show you, and I, I'll literally translate, try to translate everything as directly as possible here. Um, 
And so, you know, first off, they're going to be And actually, let me let me fill in these entries. So, min value is going to be this, and max value is going to be this. Um, and so, let's translate everything directly. So, uh, min value is this, max value is this. Um, then there is a switch table. Um, Okay, I guess we want to kind of use assembler macros. Um, but then we want to go back and fill in specific entries, which is a little bit annoying. Um, but let's uh, say we want to repeat this thing X number of times. And for each of those cases, we want to fill in the address of um, I mean, I'll write like base default. Um, so this is basically just filling in that table um, with this many. Like, I haven't implemented this actually, which I showed. It's very easy to implement in my macro assembler. But what this does is it takes some constant expression that can be computed at assembly time, and then it executes the following thing that many times. Uh, and so this is basically just going to fill up this table with uh, a bunch of references to, to this label, which is a code label. Um, and um, then I'm going to have a marker here uh, for the end so that um, basically once it, I'm, I'm kind of going to do the moral equivalent of this kind of thing uh, so that once we're done I can switch the origin back to um, to the end of the table uh, but it's not uh, it's you know we, you could do it in different ways but let's just do it that way uh, and then for the switch table end I guess I would switch to, can I do, I can't remember if you can actually do this. No, sh because normally when you do origin stuff, um, I'm trying to remember what the best way to fill sparse tables in an assembly. Like it's not, conceptually uh, a complicated task but um it's definitely something where having helpers is nice i mean one thing you can certainly do in theory is you can do this minus this uh plus, times eight times four times four um i'm just going to pretend this works you may actually have to uh subtract uh, the beginning of the section. So if if normal dollar, I think you probably have to do this. Uh, normally, when you do dot org, it always specifies an offset relative to the beginning of the section, and so uh, you you have to specify a constant. And so in order to get a constant, I have to subtract this from the beginning of the segment. Uh, and you know you would probably want to have a helper for this, but um, let's do it this way. Um, to be as explosive as possible. Um, actually, let's make a macro. Um, Um, in it entry um, and what do we have to specify we have to specify a value and a label so dot org switch table uh, value minus min value times four something like that um, 
init entry. This is the kind of reason, by the way, you want a macro assembler, because as soon as you're doing this kind of stuff, you really want some level of automation. Like some assemblers may even have features for specifically helping you with jump tables. But um, if your macro language doesn't have the facilities uh, to kind of roll your own, that uh, that is a problem because you'll run into custom tables and other stuff you want to fill in. So what was it? Uh, case zero. Um, all right. Okay, let's do it like that. Sorry, a little bit of a detour. Um, okay. Um, and then the next thing is we, um, and, and let's do this by uh, doing the subtraction, I suppose. Although you have to be worried about overflow in that case, so maybe let's not do that. Um, so. Um, to see whether we can even use the jump table, we have to uh, we have to check whether both of these conditions are true. Um, and so the way we're going to do it, as as usual with ifs, is we're going to conditionally skip this computed go to if any of if either of these conditions are violated. So you want to basically um, um, you want to uh, com load a, load some immediates. Um, I'm just gonna. I mean, you can do it, um, just do it right before. And you say, if um, if uh, x is less than min value, then, um, and actually we will, rather than doing this, like a, rather than having an unconditional thing here, we'll just go directly to uh, case default, right? We don't have to, there's no point in, in conditionally branching to an unconditional branch to somewhere else. We can just short, short circuit that and go directly there. And similarly here, if um, if x is greater than max value, then we go to case default. Um, I mean, you can do it like this, I guess. Um, and then um, we subtract. Um, I mean, you, you can write x minus t1, um, and then you can. Uh, load um, well, let's just say like ideally this is I guess something I should mention ideally when you're doing um, it would be nice when you're doing the load or the reference to the switch table if it's actually nearby in the code so you can use a PC relative reference um, within the 12 bit, or I guess it's 13 bits because there's implicit. No, I guess for, for, for loads, it's just 12 bits. There's no implicit um, two bit alignment like there is for branches. Um, but it would be nice, basically, if, um, if it, it, very nice, if the switch table is near, it, it's first off in the code, like it's in the code segment next to the code so that it's a short range so we can use these kinds of PC relative references. Um, make sure switch table. It is nearby. Um, but yeah, let's write it this way and hope this synthesizes a one instruction PC relative load. Um, uh, and then we uh, overwrite. Um, so let's, let's see what else we have to do. Uh, we're indexing. Uh, we're indexing here. We have to turn this into a um, a byte offset. Uh, so we have to multiply by four because it's a four byte pointer. And so we have to shift um, we have to shift this left by two places. Then we have to um, load the address of the switch table um, and add. Uh, Add this to get the uh, address. Um, 
then you load that entry, and then you do an indirect jump to that entry. Um, I think that's it. Let me just read that code. So we do range checks here, um, and uh, we we do the subtraction to bias it by the min value. Uh, we multiply that by four with a left shift by two in order to turn that logical index into a byte offset. Then we load the table address, uh, and we want this to. Uh, you basically want this to be. I guess it's. No, anyway. Um, load that table. Add the offset to the table address. Do a load from that to get the entry, and then do a jump. I think that's it. Um, and uh, and then for these cases, you know, these go tos gets replaced by just jumps. Um, Let's see, and this falls through and yeah. Um all right. I think that's pretty much it for switches. Um hopefully there's no typos. Um but that's the gist of it. If you wanted to do the two-level table, um, that might be a fun exercise for you to to code up. But you know, you do a byte load, and then you use that as an index into the second table, like pretty much like how we wrote the C code. Just translate that to uh, to assembly, and you should be good. Uh, all right, I think that's it. Um, so let's see if anyone mentioned something for that. Um, boom, boom, boom. All right. Um, so let's move to functions. So that that was maybe a bigger detour than intended, um, but um, maybe kind of an interesting example of some techniques that um, were other that weren't really covered otherwise in, in, here because we were trying to stay simple. So I guess this is a little bit more of an advanced topic compared to the rest. Um, and uh but you know it's uh, very good to know this stuff and certainly if you're looking at compiler output it's good for you to recognize when stuff like this is happening so you you can see what's going on um all righty um so let's move to functions uh let's move to functions um all right so for functions Um, so, so far, if you remember all the way back from the beginning, I have been uh, assuming that local variables fit in registers, and for the time being, we're going to continue assuming that, you know, within a given function, um, the register pressure is not so great that you have to sp spill internally in the function. However, uh, one case where, um, where the use of a stack um, becomes necessary, or temp memory of some sort, um, in theory, it doesn't have to be a stack. Uh, it could be globals as long as you don't need functions to be reentrant. But traditionally nowadays, um, everyone uses a stack for that kind of temp storage. Um, but but yeah, like even if you don't need uh, to spill local variables for your own local register pressure, when you're calling another function, um, if you're using, uh, well, let me talk about it. Um, um, let me let me talk about it. Um, doesn't have so much register pressure that it needs to spill um, local variables to stack or other memory. Um, as soon as you're uh, calling other functions, uh, as soon as you're inter in inter interacting uh, with other functions, you typically need 
to save and restore um, certain registers um, uh, using the stack. And so um, uh, two types of, of, of registers uh, as far as calling conventions go. Uh, caller save registers must be um, preserved by the caller uh, around function calls. So for example, um, let's see here. I, I should try to use, like RISC V has a, a further ABI, not that I, I, I want to overemphasize their specific ABI, but let's try to use um, the names of their caller save registers. Um, yeah, S. What's an S1? Why is there no S1? Um, Um, wants to uh, use the value in the register after the called function returns, i.e. the call. Um, so for example, uh, if you're writing a recursive function like pictorial, If you uh, translate this directly to assembly in the else branch, you're um, required to call um, fact recursively and then multiply result when it returns by n. So you have to preserve um, the value of n. Uh, until after the, uh, the, recursive, the recursive call returns. If n is stored in a uh, caller save register, <laughs> this is kind of confusing because it's recursive. So <laughs> uh, It's actually better if it's two different functions because then you can talk about which of them is responsible for saving a specific register depending on whether it's the caller or callee. But here it's it's serving in both roles, so it's maybe uh, needlessly confusing. But um, um, Then you have to uh, save n uh, on the stack somewhere, usually on the stack, before you do the recursive call. And then after returning, you restore n's value from its uh, temporary storage location, like the stack. Um, uh, on an architecture where uh, that has push pop instruction. This usually looks like this. Uh, push n, call f, pop n. Um, um, however, on risk architectures, there usually aren't dedicated push pop instructions. Or indeed, um, a uh, an explicit 
uh, notion of a stack at all, and it's uh, purely uh, a convention, and the stack is purely an ABI calling convention. Um, for example, on risk five, standard ABI, um, the stack pointer SP is stored in uh, register X2, and it and the stack grows downwards. So you might uh, look. So you might naively uh, implement this kind of push pop sequence as follows. Um, Uh, since the stack grows downward, um, this is done with a subtract. Um, Let's see here. Um, Um, Kali save that is for uh, caller save registers. Kali save registers um, are the opposite. Um, if n lived in a Kali save register, then I could just call. Uh, recursively call uh, fact directly and I'm guaranteed as the caller that n will have uh, uh, its same value upon return. This means that if the uh, callee, the called function, uh, wants to use a callee save register for its own purposes, um, it must save and restore it um, for uh, must save and restore it. Um, this is usually done in the epilogue prologue of the function near the uh, SP adjustment. So if n were in a callee save register, we might uh, have code that looks like this. So 42 is just a number I'm making up. Um, it's, it's too big. Um, but the point is there's a bunch of space there. Um, and um, um, the point is, if yeah, if n was somehow a callee save register, uh, we would be responsible for, uh, for saving it and restoring it. 
um, like this. And so if I call fact, I know that the register, the end register, uh, I mean, here I'm kind of assuming it has a fixed role, uh, but um, I'm responsible for saving and restoring it somehow. Um, somehow. It's unspecified how it's done. Uh, and in particular, um, Um, I don't know if using a recursive function for the illustration of these things is necessarily the right place to start, but I'm just going to stick with it for now and maybe adjust it later. But but that's basically the idea. So um, for call you say variables, you don't have to do it this way. In th in theory, you can push down this push and pop, you can push it down to, if, if only one specific branch needs to use a, a call save register, you can push it down um, to that branch. But if it's something that's used overall in the function, uh, you, you will want to, to, to factor out uh, the save and restore uh, to the epilogue and prologue. And honestly, uh, if you look at what com code compilers generate, I usually see them put all of the save resource stuff for call save registers that are used uh, in, the, uh, in the prologue and epilogue. So, um, I, I, I think that's reasonable. Um, all right. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, what about calls and returns themselves, um, on older Cisc architectures? Um, there were dedicated call, uh, call writ instructions that pushed and popped the return address from the stack. Um, as with uh, most other things, uh, this went, uh, this changed with uh, stacks. This changed with uh, with risk uh, risk architectures. Um, for example, um, I mean, this is really not exceptional for RISC-V. This is something that goes back to, at least to MIPS. I actually don't know who the first, um, instead of a call in, uh, of a call instruction um, that pushes the return address on, uh, on the stack directly as a side effect, um, RISC-V and MIPS and most other RISCs. Um, has a jump and link instruction, um, which puts the return address in a designated link ad register, link in a designated register. Um, And for returns, there isn't uh, any special support at all. You just do uh, an indirect jump to the value um, uh, based on uh, the value in the link register, which contains the return address. Um, Let's see here. <clears throat> um, I guess one thing I want to, to, to mention is why, like, why, why did they change this? So one reason is, of course, uh, as I talked about way back when we introduced Risk Five, is that, um, among other things, risks are uh, load store architectures, meaning only typically only does 
excuse me, only designated at load store instructions, read and write memory, um, compared to older CISCs where, you know, pretty much any instruction could grab an operand from memory or write an operand to memory, a uh, destination uh, to memory. Um, and, um, and so for something like JAL, um, if, if it was a, you know, aside from hard coding the stack as an explicit concept, it would also need to, uh, as a side effect, write to memory. Uh, and so by factoring things uh, up this way, you have something that writes to a register. And if you then want to put it in memory on a stack, that's a separate store instruction. Um, however, um, for um, reentrant subroutines like uh, recursive functions, um, uh, you uh, uh, you do need to save and restore instances on the stack, but um, with but but. But with risks, it's uh, now your job to do the saving and restoring. Um, and so, for example, let me show you. Let me show you an example. Um, and typically, you store this at um, at the top of the frame. Um, and so I guess in this case, 42 minus 4 is, uh, is uh, 38. And so um, Okay, so something like this. Um, so we're responsible, as with everything else that goes on the stack, we're responsible for putting it there. Um, when someone calls us, they use JAL, and uh, if the ABI convention says that the link register is always an X1, uh, or is always X1, then we know that the return address, rather than being on top of the stack immediately upon entering the called function the way it would be on x86, for example, we know that it's an x1, and so um, unless this is a leaf function, uh, which doesn't need to use this register and call another function, um, uh, but assuming that's not the case, and for a leaf function that isn't the case, uh, and for a recursive function that isn't the case, most of the time we need to recurse, uh, we have to save it off on the stack um, and restore it when we're done so that we know, uh, so we can figure out where to continue, right? Which is what the return address specifies. Um, Um, all right. Uh, that pretty much covers the basics. Let's try uh, writing out the code for uh, all of fact. And so um, I put in this value of 42, uh, which is way bigger than needed, but I just didn't want to guess ahead. Um, this will basically be the size of the stack frame, which is going to have to accommodate, you know, the um, the the return address, assuming it's not a leaf function, and you have to push that. Um, any uh, any spilled local variables, any um, you know, if you if any room for caller save or callee save registers that you want to push there. Um, so typically, the way it works is, you know, when you're writing your code, you put in a value. Uh, and then as you're writing your code and you're figuring out how much stuff needs to live on the stack, you um, you you make you, you know you you calculate what the the space required is and you set the sub and add to that value at the end. So that's not something you can anticipate ahead of time. You just know that generally speaking, unless it's a very small leaf function, um, there is going to be some sort of adjustment at the entry and exit point of the function, and uh, you know this will change as the function grows or shrinks or whatever uh, over time. So um, so so let me just put in like dot 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 just to signify I don't quite know. Uh, what it will be ahead of time. Um, I know that um, 
this thing uh, I'm going to put in a bunch of dots so that because I don't know the offsets yet unfortunately there won't be too many offsets needed um, and so if you go back to our original uh, original code we have to check if something is zero and so um, um, one thing we could do is we can say if um, the zoom argument is passed in register a zero, which is um, caller save, right? Because uh, when you pass an argument, the, the function you're calling is allowed to clobber it. Um, it's for the use of the uh, of uh, of the callee, and so if the caller wants to preserve it, you have to. Um, I'm trying to remember where is right a zero. Um, Okay, so that's the basic epilogue and prologue. Um, let me just pull this code out. Let's do it like that. Um, so save this, and then we have to check if um, uh, if a if it's non-zero, um, or, or let me do this. If it's zero, uh, then we do a forward jump, and in this forward jump, uh, all we're really going to do is we are going to um, set the return value, which is also a one. We're going to set that to uh, to one, uh, and then it's just going to fall through the, to this code. And uh, if that is not true, then we have a non-zero value. And um, I am going to um, let's see. I'm going to save the value of a one, and then restore it afterwards. Um, um, then I'm going to call fact recursively. Um, let's see here. Uh, I have to subtract one from from this register here. I call the function, uh, and then I have to uh, restore the thing I, I saved, and I have to multiply by that, um, and then I have to jump to two, and two is here. Um, and I think that's it. So the two things we have to save are the return address, so we know where to return to, and the, the value of essentially n. We're, we're saving the value of n across the recursive function call. Um, 
and so that's two 30, uh, 32-bit values, and so that's eight uh, eight bytes. Um, I guess you can uh, you can save this thing at that offset. This thing at I'm going to, to write zero just to be explicit. Uh, you can obviously, at least in my assembler, you can leave out the zero and it's implicit. But I just want to emphasize that um, these are different offsets of the stack pointer uh, because the stack grows down. I think this is right. I can't remember if the risk five conventional stack pointer is off by one, but um, this is kind of what I'm used to. Um, so let's see, let's store that at that offset. So uh, the first slot in the stack, we store the return address, and we also we save the return address and we also store from it there. And then um, if the argument is zero, we branch to one, in which case we load a return value of zero and then fall through. Um, if it's non-zero, then we have to save the value of the argument, which is n. We save that in this slot. Um, then we subtract uh, one from the in-place version, the one that hasn't been saved. So we've already saved the original version, so we can destroy this one in place, subtracting one, calling the function recursively. Um, and then upon returning from the function, restoring the original argument value, into, and we'll store it in T1, and then we're going to multiply uh, A0 by it, and then we're going to jump to the uh, epilogue, which is number two. Um, so yeah. Um, Oh, someone's asking, what is meant by the function epilogue and prologue? Is it just a fancy way of saying uh, stack setup and teardown, or does something actually happen? Yeah, like, uh, I think these are standard terms, function prologue and epilogue. It just usually refers to the sort of boilerplate um, that happens uh, at the entry point and at the exit point. So it usually involves sort of, yeah, like pushing and popping stuff uh, and setting things up. Um, and so those are supposed to sort of undo each other so that when you exit, you know, yeah, like you said, you tear down what you set up previously. Um, but those are conventional terms, so those are good to know. Function prologue and epilogue. Let's see here. Um... But yeah, so, so 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 this is pretty standard. Um, and this is about as simple as a recursive function gets. Note, of course, that you shouldn't uh, actually implement Pictorial as a recursive function. So this is uh, only a uh, 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 an example. For example, um, you can see the the two elements, the two values we need to save on the stack are the return address um, and the uh, and the variable n whose lifetime survives the uh, recursive call. Um, uh, this assumes that T1 is a uh, caller save register. Um, let's. Uh, let me show the version using a callee save register instead. Um, so, if uh, so, so let me start from the inside out and show the adjustments that are required. If this was a callee register, uh, and let's use the one of the ones that are actually in the spec, uh, like S two. The difference is um, uh, 
Okay, so we'll use S2. So let's start from the inside. The main difference is that rather than doing a save and restore to memory, we're going to do a save and restore from registers. So, um, in fact, it simplifies slightly. Um, so you can see here that um, rather, oh, and this would be just a register to register move. So we replace the store to memory for the stack slot. Um, but yeah, it, let me show you. We are not done yet. I'm just going to do the, the part around the call. So rather than doing a save and a load to save and restore the value, we just move to a register. Uh, we don't have to move out of the register. We can use it directly as a multiplication operand. Um, but now the problem is, since this is a callee save and we are a recursive function, um, we are responsible, since we overwrite S, right, we overwrite S here, if someone calling us expects S2 to be saved, which is, you know, what the calling convention says we have to assume, uh, because S2 is callee save, we have to save this on entry. And so the thing that changes is that... Um, is that you have to do this. Um, and I'm going to try to do this in reverse order um, to, to, have to match the kind of logical push pop uh, forward backward thing. Um, so this is the main thing that changes is that here we don't have to worry about saving and restoring it to memory. But then because, uh, this is because it's a recursive function, which kind of um, means that it's not really helping us, right? Uh, it's not really helping us. Um, the uh, It just means that now you're kind of required to restore this here. Now, in theory, you could do something, you could, if you really wanted to, you could imagine pushing this down around here and similarly putting this after um after we are done with s2 like you could imagine actually doing something like this so that you only do um the callee save operations sort of in the tightest possible scope in which case what you're doing from a sort of if you just look at this code narrowly it doesn't look a whole lot different from what we were doing before um but uh Um, but that's kind of the idea. Um, all right, how are we doing on time? We still have time. Um, all right, let's let's say that. Uh, one thing I want to show is one of the reasons why these more register-oriented conventions and why splitting registers into callee save and caller save can be really useful. And one case that really shows that is a leaf function. Um, uh, these conventions passing uh, the return address in a register uh, designated some registers as caller save and others as callee save uh, are um, can be really helpful. Um, really show their strengths in leaf functions. So suppose you want to do a leaf function like, I don't know, let's just say we want to write a square function. And of course this is silly, right? But let's just, you, you um, let's just say you wanted to do something very simple like this, okay? Um, Here's how simple it is. Um, uh, because the return address uh, is passed in a register, I'm calling and read from a register uh, when returning. And where and the leaf function by definition isn't uh, by definition isn't calling other functions. 
we never have to save restore um, the return address in memory. So yeah, this is a very simple example. Um, So yeah, that's that, that's kind of why this is so. One of the reasons why this is so nice. Um, I mean, there are other cases. Uh, th this is a particularly easy case because we're not really using any other register. Everything is kind of in place, so it's almost too simple. But um, I, I think it does show one extreme of why these conventions are more efficient. There's, aside from the instruction fetching, of course, uh, which, I mean, if it's an instruction cache, that's pretty good. Um, there's basically no undo memory traffic here, which is very nice. Uh, and if this was x86, um, the call and return instructions would, you know, there would be a, a, at least a push and a pop of the return address, even if everything else was passed in registers. For example, in x64, the standard calling conventions passes the first four arg integer arguments and registers, RCX, RDX, R8, and R9, I think it is. Um, and the return address, I guess, is, is an RAX. Uh, maybe, yeah, I think RAX. Um, and so those things are passed in registers, but the call and return instructions are still stack-based. So those will always touch memory. Uh, and with this kind of risk approach, we split things up. Um, not only is, are, are things more simple, like the pieces are simpler, they do mo mostly just one thing. Um, they don't, as a side effect, touch memory unless you're doing a load and store, um, but it also means that cases like this are more efficient. So that's pretty neat. Um, I think that's it as far as functions go. Um, there's definitely more to be said, um, but you can kind of generalize from this. Uh, like, it becomes more hairy, right? Like, there's a reason I chose a simple example. When you get more things that are, have to be preserved, uh, I, whether they're callee save or caller save, you, there's more stack slots. You have to manage the stack offsets, all that stuff. Of course, that's not um, the most fun thing in the world. Uh, that's one of the things a compiler will do for you that uh, co causes cognitive load for no good. I would say no, almost no good reason. It's not really a value add in most cases for a programmer to do this work. That's just one of those kind of mental taxes of programming directly in assembly uh, is managing the stack. But conceptually, it's what we have been doing in these simple examples. It's just there's more of it, so there's more cognitive load to manage. But um, someone's asking, uh, isn't RET a sysclike instruction, e.g. RIP MIPS requires, uh, oh yeah, it uses RA? Well, I can't remember what RISC does, at least in, um, in uh in risk five ret just literally is a jump to the abi's return address register which is ra right so it is a pseudo instruction but it has a one-to-one -one translation to a single other instruction it's it's really just encoding a convention around what register contains the return address so if you look here um ret is just a JALR, so this is an indirect jump. I'm writing it as a jump because I have pseudo instructions for jumps, but it's a JLR, which means you're jumping and linking, but you're not really linking because you're setting the link register to X0, so you're just throwing away the the link uh, value. Uh, and yeah, so that's really all red is. It's just a pseudo instruction that, in, that does an indirect jump to x1 and x1 is by convention by the abi convention is the, the link uh, register the return address register and similarly call i mean there's two parts to it there's just loading the offset which is sort of a separate piece but um, in terms of the jump itself it's a jlr targeting the abi's ra register which is x1 um, so if you look up here you can see x1 is ra so that's really all it is um, 
you can write it out by hand, but I think these pseudo instructions, at least when you're writing code, communicate convention. And as long as they're not obfuscating a complicated sequence of instructions or introducing hidden cost or whatever, I think they're a, a good a good tool. And it's also something a disassembler can handle. Like a disassembler, for example, can be ABI aware and knows that a certain sequence generally corresponds to a return um, and can translate it as such in the disassembly. All right. Um, but anyway, no, it's not a Cisc-like instruction. It doesn't have any memory traffic. It's just encoding a ABI convention around uh, what register contains the link address or the return address. All right. Um, I think that's almost it. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about um, this is something that I think when you're doing it by hand is not going to be very complicated, but uh, I've been pretty cavalier about ha how to translate nested expressions. And I just wanted to make a small note um, on better and worse ways of translating nested expressions to statements in terms of the register allocation side of things. Um, like left associative versus right associative and left to right evaluation versus right to left evaluation and stuff like that, because it has implications and um, it should become apparent. Um, so, um, one, one thing I, I'm not going to cover a lot because this is sort of open ended, but I mentioned that I assumed that our kind of our local variables, I assume, don't have to be spilled, that we don't have. Uh, so much register pressure that they need to be spilled. Um, without saying too much about that, it's the same idea as the rest of it. Aside from making room in, in your stack frame for you know return address and any uh, registers you need to save and restore according to the calling conventions, you also make room for any data that needs to be spilled uh, and you put it there and you save and restore it. And there's no simple ad, uh, recipe for how to manage that. That's sort of, you know, uh, even in compilers, spill management, uh, spill code generation, and figuring out the best way to do it uh, can get pretty hairy. When you're a human programmer, it's usually easier to figure out the natural the natural things that uh, need to, like when they need to be spilled and unspilled and stuff like that. Um, aside from that, other cases that require putting stuff on the stack is like when you're, um, anytime you're taking the address of something and you want to address it as memory, you have to temporarily spill it to memory. Uh, well, you have two options. You can either spill it to memory always so that basically it lives on the stack and only gets loaded uh, right when you're accessing it and then gets put back on the stack so that anything that wants to access it via address it always has the latest version on the stack. That's the easiest way to do it, to just have it permanently live on the stack and only do quick sort of loads and stores into temporaries and immediately right back to the stack uh, to make sure the stack version is always up to date. Or um, if you're just using it internally in a function, you can scope you know you can have it live in registers most of the time and then move it into the stack right around the time when it needs to be addressable as memory for example if um if you're calling a function um the and you want to pass a pointer to a variable as an argument to that function a natural thing to do is uh, first off locate that variable in a um in a caller save register because then you're required to save it anyway so then you can save it and you can pass a pointer to the saved slot as the address you're calling uh, that you're passing to the function you're calling so stuff like that um, but um, that stuff I think there's no simple recipes that's more of a playing it by ear kind of thing um, and ideally you want to try to stay away from writing code that requires too much crazy spill management um, sometimes it's unavoidable but um, Having 32 registers available, like on Risk Five and, and most other risks, uh, many other risks at least, uh, really helps the burden compared to old school x86, where you have eight registers, um, and some of them are not even true GPRs, like the stack pointer, uh, and a bunch of them are taken for fixed purposes and whatnot. So there's very few ones available truly for your for your, for your use. So with 32 registers, um, you can run out of them, but it's rare for sure. All right. Um, let's see here. Um, dun, dun, dun.
Okay, so yeah, let me just make a few uh, a few comments on uh, a quick note on uh, on, uh, you know, on on flattening uh, expressions uh, and register allocation. So uh, one thing you run into is that um, I've been kind of like I said I've been kind of loose about exactly how like I mentioned you have to unnest expressions when translating to assembly code but I wasn't super clear on how to do that kind of rigorously. It's mostly self-explanatory, um, but I wanted to make a note on how different choices can affect code quality. Um, generic recipe um, for translating A op B is to um, um, is to, um, to generate the code for um, for evaluating A and putting the result in T1. Then, uh, let's see, then generate the code for evaluating uh, B and putting the result in T2 and then uh, generating T1 uh, equals T1 op T2 um, to combine the sub-expression results as required. Um, so what I mean by this is, I think you can tell what I mean. So for example, um, example to evaluate um, Um, and here I'm using A and B, like imagine there are like uh, things that have to be loaded or something like that, like local, uh, global variables. So, so the operation of assigning them to a temp register is is an explicit operation. Um, so uh, you do uh, you do this part, and that finishes the innermost part. Then you do this, and you do this, and you do this, um, and you do this. Uh, and in a case like this, uh, you might do um, you know, we just translated directly here. Um, boom, boom, boom. And so, let's see. Right. So this is this is a good translation. Um, this is a good translation. This is basically the optimal translation, unless there's instruction scheduling or stuff like that. But in terms of register allocation and sort of minimum number of instructions, this is optimal, uh, in isolation at least. Um, uh, however, suppose we use the same uh, left to right uh, order uh, translation on the corresponding right associative uh, grouping of the same expression. Um, what I mean by this, and I want to show a kind of a pathology that can happen. Um,
So you start by loading A as before, um, but now we have to recursively load, uh, or we have to recursively generate code for this thing over here. Now the problem is we've already committed to storing A in a temp register, so um, we uh, we now have to store B in a temp register, and then we have to recursively go over here, and so now we have to restore B uh, C in a temp register, and then D in a temp register. And now you can start uh, doing the folding. Um, so you can start doing the reduction um, like this. Uh, and then you can do this and you can do uh, this. Uh, So yeah, um, this is something. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the proofreading. So yeah, so this is something you run into, is that if you uh, if you code generate left to right, meaning you recursively code generate code to produce the left operand, um, then after you've done that, while you're then code generating the result for the right operand, you have to keep the left operands result in a temp register um, and so you really want to generate the branch like of the two cases like of the two subtrees of this expression you want to handle the one that's the most like the the you want to handle like the deepest right um, now in the case of addition of course um, you can use either of them but I just wanted to point out that this kind of stuff does matter um, and that generally, if you're doing the left to right approach, which, you know, if you want to take C code, uh, it's convenient to follow uh, the same ordering in the assembly code as there is in the source code. And as a result, um, left associative expressions are naturally more compatible or more efficient with that left to right translation approach. Um, now, fortunately, the way the our parser works and generally the way parsers work is that they produce an AST that's also left associative. So when you write things without explicit grouping, uh, you the AST that's produced corresponds to the less left associative grouping. And hence, if you do the naive left to right translation, you get the good register allocation with a minimum number of temp registers. Whereas if uh, in the reverse case, um, you get a really terrible register allocation that has absolutely terrible register pressure, even for something that should be really trivial. Um, and incidentally, this is one of the reasons why compilers like to reserve the right to, well, that's not totally true. I was going to say this is one of the reasons why compilers like to have the right to change the evaluation order for left and right operands. So C, for example, doesn't specify that um, A has to be read before B. And so even if you know these are functions with potential side effects, C doesn't actually specify that uh, the compiler has to translate the code as if first f executes and then g executes it doesn't specify that that's left undefined um, and this is the sort of thing where um, at least if there are side effects having this ability means that the compiler can generate better code um, even though uh, as a programmer you would probably want more consistent well well-defined semantics for that stuff so you can depend on it um, of course, in a case like this, where maybe there are no side effects to the different sub-expressions, the compiler is totally free to reassociate it to whatever is most convenient. And instead of reassociating it, it can also just, um, I don't want to go into this here too much, but there's something called Sethi Ullman. Uh, it's a classic algorithm, and it's basically how to do optimal register allocation for this kind of case. Um, and um, it shows you how to do the optimal thing. Uh, assuming you don't have to worry about side effects uh, or whatever. But um, this is how to handle the general case. In practice, uh, most mo the way most people naturally write code doesn't require you to do very, like you can, even if you process the, the, the code the way people write it directly, just following the natural syntactic structure of the source code, doing a naive left to right translation, you generally don't get too bad 
code quality, even without something like Sethi Allman. But I uh, just wanted to to mention Sethi Allman since it's something you see in, uh, I think I first saw it in the Dragon Book. It's kind of a classic topic in compiler textbooks. Um, look up the Sethi Allman. Um, all right. I think this is pretty much it for what I wanted to cover. Um, let's just go back to the top. Like, I, d I don't want to talk about register allocation in general because there's really not much to be said, especially for human programmers. Or if you know for human assembly programmers, obviously if you're writing a compiler, there's a whole literature, and uh, well, there's both a science to it and also a black art to it. Which uh, the biggest problem being that register allocation isn't done in a vacuum. But uh, I, I'm not sure what I can really say in generality about it, other than uh, the the case of expressions where um, you kind of want to make sure that you end up with something like this rather than something like this. So you want the left associative sort of in place folding rather than the right associative recursive approach, which has um, like this is basically like a stack, right? It's building up a stack of temp registers and then it's reducing it after it's built it up. Whereas with the left associative folding, um, you only really, you know, you only there, like a T1 basically acts as an accumulator and T2 acts as a temp to load the, the second operand. So, so this is what you want. Um, anyway. I think that's it for today, uh, and that pretty much finishes the three-part series on assembly. Um, hopefully this was useful to some folks, uh, and now I also feel like I covered some of this stuff, um, somewhat explicitly at least, uh, rather than just sort of assuming people knew this stuff. Um, I don't think this is complete by any means, and obviously you have to actually go do it in order to become fluent and comfortable with it, but um, I think this is a good sort of overview, and also uh, I, once we get to the compiler, I will be able to refer to this for some of the templates because once you write a simple-minded compiler, a lot of these things are essentially uh, you want to do the same sort of thing in a compiler that you do here uh, for code generation. So knowing how these things correspond is important for that as well. All right, that is it. And um, unless there are questions, I will sign off for today. And um, uh, next stream will be on. Uh, we will start on hardware design stuff uh, using Python, embedded domain-specific languages in Python and stuff like that. So that should be fun. I still have to do more prep work before I can really start talking about that, but I'm um, looking forward to that. So that should be next time. All right, cool. I will be uh, signing off then. See everyone next time, which is... Today for me is Monday, so it'll be Wednesday for me. But I guess if you're in the U.S., it's probably Sunday, and it will be Tuesday for you. But uh, anyway, have a good have a good day, everyone.